This, uh, this week, my, one of my fellow pastors, Gary Dozier, was ministering to a family uh, who had lost a son. And I was listening in, and uh, he was bringing the hope that we were just singing about. The hope that we, God knows about the loss of a son. The son, his beloved son. He so loved that he didn't just lose, he gave his son for us. He didn't send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And one of the things that, uh, that Gary said that really spoke to my heart, and I just share it with you, is that things like this, even just this time today, just gathering to worship, or either draw us toward God or we choose to move away from God. And uh, that's so true. Even as we approach his word, the response to God's word is so crucial. So as we turn to his word, I want you to turn to Luke 20. We're back in Luke uh, we've been away from Luke for, you know, December, January, whatever, although we took one, one time in Luke 20 during our uh, series when we said, he loved, we love, uh, and looked at Luke 20, but we want to get back into it, and today, the evil character of unbelief. The evil character of unbelief. You know, that great gospel, the good news, God so loved that he gave. He didn't send his son to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who does not believe in him has been judged already, the next verse says. Unbelief. Take care, brethren, the writer to Hebrews says. Take care, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief. Not taking God at his word. Unbelief. You know, Jesus said when he, you know, I'm leaving, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. In fact, it's to your advantage that I go away. I'm going to send another helper. And when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then he describes the sin, the righteousness, and the judgment. I'm quoting out of John 16, verse 8. And verse 9 says, concerning sin, what's the one sin we have a promise that God will convict us of as unbelievers? Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. I know that if I'm speaking to your heart, if you're listening, the Holy Spirit will convict your heart of unbelief. Uh, This is the witness that God has given us concerning his Son. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, 1 John 5. He who believes has the witness in himself. He who does not believe has made God a liar. I'm quoting. God says that unbelief is calling him a liar. 1 John 5, verse 10. Don't do that. The evil character of unbelief. Now, I see it as kind of the the theme that ties this whole chapter together. Uh, You remember, just glance back with me, uh, the first eight verses. They came and they confronted him, Jesus, about his authority. Who gave you this authority? How can you say those things? You know, Well, their unbelieving attitude. And then the parable of the vineyard, which we looked at in December, uh, and on through the rest of the chapter, it ties this together. What I want to do is just pick it up, uh, which I think it's always wise to do, to pick it up in uh, a little bit of context. Whenever you read the Bible, 
uh, read a little context. So let me just read. I'm not going to expose it, but uh, I want to just read, starting at verse 9, to hear the context, the parable of the vineyard, before we get into our text, which is verses 19 through 26. So verse 9, he began to tell the people this parable. A parable is just throwing something down next to something more significant. Telling an everyday story that everybody gets. It's like you're sitting at the bus stop, you know, and you immediately get a picture of something. And then he compares an everyday occurrence to spiritual truth. So he said this parable, a man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey for a long time. And at the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order that they might give him some of the produce of the vineyard. They had an arrangement. It was common. You know, you take care of the field, uh, and the rent for the land will be so much of the, of the crop. And so he sent his slave to uh, get some of the produce of the vineyard, but the vine growers, growers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send another slave and they beat him also and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he proceeded to send a third. And this one also they wounded and cast out. And the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my beloved son. They will respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another, saying, This is the heir. Let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. And they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What, therefore, will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. And when they heard what Jesus had said, when they heard this story, they said, May it ain't all. May it never be. They were just, they shuddered at the story. Now, Jesus is telling a parable. He's not just telling a story. He sent slave after slave to his vineyard, Israel. We, when we looked at this, we saw this is right out of Isaiah 5. Israel was his vineyard, and he expected it to, to produce fruit, and he sent prophet after prophet after prophet, and they killed him. <laughs> they rejected him. They didn't listen to him. A lot of those guys lost their life, proclaiming God's grace and God's love. Finally, he sent his beloved son, and we know what took place. Verse 17, he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ, the one Israel rejected, the one they said, away with him. You want me to crucify your, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, you want me to crucify your king? As he just kind of ground their nose in his authority over them as the Roman governor, and they said, we have no king but Caesar. Well, I'm going to wash my hands of the whole thing. I don't see any problem with him. And, he said, and they said, his blood be on us. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. He quotes the 118th Psalm. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, and the prophets all pointed to him, and they all told of his first coming and his second coming. He would be one who suffered, and he would be one who rules. And if you stumble on him, look at verse 18. You have, by the way, as Jesus summarizes his story, you have the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rejected one who is God's choice 
and precious cornerstone. God is, everything God is doing is through this rock of offense, this stone of stumbling. He's the very foundation of the church that he's building. You can't come to God except through Jesus Christ. Well, everyone who falls on that stone, if you stumble over Jesus Christ, you'll be broken to pieces. And on whomever it falls, and we mentioned this, he picks up on Daniel. Daniel was that unique prophet of the Hebrew prophets who told much more than just what was going to happen to Israel and the nation, although they all spoke of the nations, because God's purposes have always been worldwide. But Daniel in particular was given the scope of world history. And he gave that great vision, God gave him the vision, and he told it, of the great kingdoms of this earth and that great statue, and finally a stone cut without hands will fall on the very feet of that statue, and the whole thing will come down. And they were very familiar with that. And he quotes it in the last part of verse 18. On whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Daniel is in Iraq. <laughs> Babylon. The Babylon kept it 500 and some years before Christ. And he prophesied not only, as all the prophets did, of the sufferings of Christ, but the glories to follow. When he comes back. So the first and second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never, uh, let me just stop here and just say this. You will never see clearly what God is doing in history if you don't bow before Jesus Christ. He's the Alpha and the Omega. God is enthralled with His Son and He's wrapping history around His Son and You'll never understand what God is building if you don't see the cornerstone. And you'll never understand the scope of history unless you come to believe in this rejected one and treat him as God treats him, as his choice and precious cornerstone. Um, by the way, that's not only true globally. You'll never make sense of the headlines if you don't see God's purpose. It's true personally. Your life. What's going on? Why did God allow this? What, what? All the things. You'll never really see life unless you start where God starts. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, he tells this story. And you wonder, how will they respond? How will they, how will you and I respond? to this. Jesus is a very clear, very clear. We, it was a few weeks ago, but I walk us back through it very briefly so we have a chance to respond to what he said. Verse 19, the scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour. And they feared the people for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. How will they respond? They'll try to lay hands on the one whose hand created the Pacific Ocean, sculpted Mount Hood. They tried to lay hands on him, God's beloved son. They're playing out the parable. I'll send my beloved son. This is the heir. Let's kill him. And they seek to lay hands on him, but they're afraid of the people. It's not very politically correct right now to do that. Uh, why? Look at verse 19. For they understood that he spoke this parable against them. Unbelief is not a matter of ignorance. They understood. It's a willful rejection of God and his son and his purposes. They understood. What, what did they understand, by the way? Look at verse 19 again. They understood that he told this parable what? Against them. They understood personal guilt. 
personal guilt. Not some, oh, bad, people are bad. I'm bad. We rejected him. Personal culpability. I deserve. They understood that. You know, anyone who's proclaimed the gospel has seen this. If you just say God loves people and he's a nice guy, then people say, that's, that's, I like that. That's good. I don't know if I believe it, but, you know, that's nice. But you tell the gospel. You tell the story of the cross. The word of the cross. And it brings this issue before us. Sin must be paid for. We're all sinners. God judges sin. His own son had to die. Oh, I don't like to hear that. And you watch, you know, whether it's in personal evangelism or in a pulpit like this, and you'll see people recoil when you get to the part that when they start to, verse 19, understand that this story is against you and me. The wages of sin is death. And I deserve to die. But God died in my place. And the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, I underline it again. Unbelief isn't a matter of not understanding. <laughs> Unbelief is a willful rejection. It's a hardening of the heart. One day, all unbelief in Christ will be seen for what it is. The product of an evil, unrepentant, hardened heart. I know we hide our unbelief under, I just don't understand. It seems to me, and we've got all our smoke screens and things, but I'm telling you, Jesus puts his finger on things. And uh, unbelief, that's why I titled this The Evil Character of Unbelief. That's why the writer to the Hebrews, chapter 3, verse 12, says, Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart. That's what God calls it. Well, verse 20, the amazing treachery. They watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so as to deliver him up to the rule and authority of the governor. Amazing treachery. They watched him. You know, the Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Well, they were dead. <laughs> Not the way the Bible... Fix your eyes on Jesus. Observe him. See the beauty. But they watched him like this. And you see it, verse 20. They watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous, who wormed their way in to listen. Notice, look at what they're after. In order that they might catch him in some statement. Literally, in order that they might take hold of his word, of his saying. Now, this is an interesting thought because I come back to it, your response to his statements, his words. Take hold. Catch them. Now the verb itself can be used positive or negative. This word that's translated catch. Take hold of. Lay hold of. And they watched that they might pretty obvious negatively take hold of. But the word just simply means to take hold of. So Jesus, when he came walking to them on the water, you remember in Matthew 14, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, <laughs> command that I come. And Peter gets out of the boat, you remember? And then he cried out when he saw the waves, realized what was going on, Lord, save me. Great prayer, by the way. Lord, save me. And Jesus took hold of his hand. That's the word. He caught him. He took hold of Peter's hand, got him back in the boat, and uh, it, it is uh, used of Jesus when he took hold in Mark 8. He took hold of the blind man's hand and uh, led him out of the village and healed him. Uh, negatively, it's used 
when Paul and Silas, I was just teaching it downtown at the art museum in Acts 16 when they first got to Europe, when they first came into Philippi, and, and they liberated that little girl that was a fortune teller, you remember, the evil spirit, and they set her free, and her owners saw they lost their money, their profit, and I'm told they seized Paul and Silas. They took hold of them, same word, and threw them into the dungeon. You know the story. Or later in Acts 21, when the mob took hold of Paul and drug him out of the temple. You can't be in here. And so you see it used positively and negatively. And I tell you, you know, fight the good fight, Timothy says. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight and take hold of eternal life. Boy, that's a great use of it. Take hold. Now... Let me just stop and apply this because this is written for us. Every time you hear God's word, every time you're confronted with it, you, uh, you either take hold of it in a negative way or take hold of it in a positive way. Um, let me encourage you. Take hold of the text. Let it take hold of you. When you read the Bible, take hold of it. Let it seize you. Let it capture you. There's another way to read the Bible, and it's very common. It's very common to uh, try to take hold of it and find some problem with it. Look at verse 20. They wanted to catch him in some statement. There's got to be a loophole here. I don't see how the Bible can say, and then fill in the blank. There's people all around you, down at your office, in your neighborhood, maybe you, who your whole thing is to take hold of the Bible and find some error in it. Take hold and catch him in some statement. Don't treat God's word that way. That's the essence of arrogance and unbelief. Now, in its own way, perhaps it has its place. You know, like these politicians, they're blarbing this and that. And the press is what? Supposed to be a watchdog and take hold and seize and catch him in something. You know, so the great issues of our time. What did Tom Brady know and when did he know it? <laughs> you know, the press, the reporters. Did you know how much air was in the football? You know, that, that's maybe their role, but that tells you a little something about our culture, what really counts, you know. Did Tom, and he contradicted himself. I think he did, and so the Seahawks should just be declared champ, don't you? <laughs> no. I'm just, but the point being, that's, that's the way they were treating God. And people do that. There are scholars. In fact, there are many scholars, PhDs, who spend their life presenting papers and looking for loopholes in the scripture and critiquing and finding so-called contradictions and errors in God's word. Billy Sunday was a superstar baseball player. I don't know if you knew that. He's my favorite evangelist. But uh, no, he was, a, he was a superstar right back at the beginning of professional baseball, very well known. And he lived like most superstars. He was, you know, his life was a mess. And he came under the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his life was transformed. And he quit baseball mid-career. And he, that's why we call William Graham, Billy Graham. Because Billy Sunday was a world-renowned evangelist in the early part of this century, and God greatly used him. And he had a way of just cutting right to the issue, just like Billy Graham did. And we can give thanks for men like that. But Billy Sunday said, there's a lot of people in hell because they spent their life quibbling over who Cain married. Remember I talked about that a few weeks ago? People still do. Looking for some little thing. And you know, don't do that. By the way, Adam and Eve lived 950 years. Uh, you look at the genealogy back then. Before sin really got hold of the human race in the sense of the corruption and the decay, people were living a long time before the flood. 
and they were told to be fruitful and multiply. They had all kinds of kids, and there was no problem with what we call incest in the early days. Obviously, the race to multiply married their sisters and brothers, and there's not, these things aren't hard to figure out, really. And Billy Sunday well said, there are people in hell today because they spent their time trying to catch the Lord. Who did Cain marry? And I've had men do that. I told you a story about that recently, of people making that their thing. Don't do that. How do you approach Jesus' words? I'm asking you. Do you let them take hold of you, or do you seek to take hold of them? Oh, let God's word catch you. Let him rescue you. Save me, Lord. And Peter, he grabbed him. That's the way to listen to God's word is to let it seize you. Don't waste your life and doom your eternity by seeking to catch God in some statement. Well, now Luke, I should say the Holy Spirit, verse 21, he gives us, uh, he gives us a couple of examples of how they did it. And the rest of chapter 20 is <laughs> examples of them seeking to catch him in some statement. And as I said, I think it ties the chapter together. I'll just look at the first one with you today, verse 21 through 25. They question him saying, "Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you're not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not?" But he detected their trickery. <laughs> and said to them, show me a denarius. Whose head and inscription does it have? And they said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Do you ever wonder why they brought taxes up <laughs> right now in this setting? Obviously, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling us how they, how they would seek to catch him. In some, they question him, saying, Teacher, we know. For they started, look at verse 21. They started with flattery. We know, teacher, that you speak and teach correctly, and you're not partial to anybody. Boy, you don't mince words. You tell it like it is. You teach the way of God in truth. They started with flattery. A lying tongue hates those it crushes, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Proverbs 26, 28. False teachers are characterized, Jude 16 says, by flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. You be careful when someone flatters you. But they started with flattery. And by the way, the cults will do this. Unbelief does this. Unbelief will say very flattering stuff about Jesus. Every cult that I know of has syrupy type of statements about Jesus. Oh, he's a wonderful angel. Or he's, he's, you know, and they'll, and people get sucked in because they're saying nice things about Jesus. You can't just say nice things about Jesus. You have to worship him. Oh, no, we don't worship him. That's the first thing I ask the cultists when they come to my door. I said, I worship Jesus Christ, do you? <clears throat> what, what, what? They just told me about him, you know, as they started into the conversation. I said, do you worship Jesus Christ? Well, that, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that depends on what you mean by worship. I said, it's pretty simple, worship. I worship him, do you? That's where I start. And usually that's where I end, by the way. <laughs> they, they, they end up, because they don't. They honor him, supposedly. They dishonor him. They say nice things about him. Oh, you teach the way of God in truth. He's a wonderful teacher. He's a wonderful prophet. He's a wonderful angel. All this other stuff. But when you get to the crux, is he Lord? Do you worship him? And I'm preaching now. I shouldn't. Let's go to <laughs> verse 22. Teacher, you're a wonderful teacher. You teach, you don't mince words. We really can trust what you say. Tell us, uh, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Wow. 
What a come down this would be if they could get the Lord Jesus embroiled in tax ballot measure 463. Really? Have you noticed that Jesus kind of has a, I call it a holy detachedness from tax ballot issues. <laughs> He's on such a higher calling, such a higher ministry than political stuff that uh, he won't lower himself. You watch the pages of the New Testament and you'll notice a detached aloofness from such things. There are many who've tried to get me involved in this ballot measure, that ballot measure, regarding taxes, regarding legitimate issues, regarding the government role in this or that. And I tell you, we have to be very careful. We need to follow our Lord's example as much as possible as a church. And I know there are people in this room who have very strong opinions about a ballot measure 463. I doubt, I hope there isn't one right now. I'm just using it as a, you know. And you think it should pass and somebody else thinks it shouldn't pass. And I tell you, you know what? Watch what our Lord, watch what our Lord says. He detected, verse 23, their trickery. He knew. He knows your smoke screens. He always knows. In fact, in Matthew's parallel account, Matthew 22, it says that he perceived their malice. And he said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Jesus said that kind of stuff, didn't he? Well, here Luke just shortens it to, uh, he detected their trickery and said to them, uh, show me a $20 bill. Who's, whose picture's on it? You know? Give me a denarius. Who's, 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 who meant that coin? Oh, it's Caesar. Well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give the rest to God. You see, government has its legitimate role. Minting money, for instance. And we should pay our taxes. In fact, if you reduced what the Bible says down, I would tell you, you know, we could have differing, in fact, I'm sure we do. Some think the government ought to tax, tax, tax because the government ought to be doing, doing, doing. And others think the government needs to do what it should do. They ought to tax some. And most people think they ought to do everything and not tax. <laughs> you know. But I'm telling you, Jesus said, you give to Caesar what is Caesar's. You give to God what is God's. Pay your taxes. Don't pay a penny more. <laughs> and don't vote for them. Uh, now I'm starting to get it, or I shouldn't go. I'm just telling you, government has its... And by the way, on the issue of government, like every other issue, what does the Scripture say? What is the role of government? And I would tell you that the government is to protect us. And the government has a very legitimate role. God established human government. But Jesus just, he doesn't sidestep this question. He just simply knows what they're up to. And he will not lower himself to get embroiled in uh, the tax ballot issue of the day. And they were unable to catch him. Did you see it? Verse 26. They were not able to take hold of one of his words. Uh, they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And marveling at his answer, they became silent. You know, people still marvel today at Jesus' words. I know even unbelievers marvel at the kind of wisdom that just said, you know, whose, whose inscription is on the coin? George Washington, okay, well then you give to the government, you give to Washington what's Washington's, and you give to God what's God's. The way he spoke, people, even unbelievers marvel, and as believers, we marvel at his word, and we should. And because of that, of course, they couldn't seize him, and they became silent. Oh, that it would have been permanently. <laughs> They'll be back. We know that. We've seen it. Today, you will not catch Jesus 
in some statement. Don't spend your life, you skeptic, saying, yeah, but if the Bible should this, well, what about that? And how do you explain looking for some statement to catch the Lord Almighty? And have you heard his voice? Have you heard his word? Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus is going to say next chapter, Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth will pass away. The Rocky Mountains will crumble. <laughs> Gibraltar will stumble. You know, that song is true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, my word will not pass away. Forever, O Lord, the psalmist said, Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled. In heaven. Oh, they're still debating about it, though, and the PhDs are still, I know, I know. But if forever your word is settled in heaven. Listen, listen to our Lord Jesus. I have come as light into the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I don't judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Oh, I beg with you, I plead with you, I, I implore you, if you've heard his voice today, don't try to find a loophole. Don't try to find a criticism. Submit to his word. Receive him. You see, your attitude toward Christ is seen in your attitude toward his word. And believers are those who say, oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I was the one. My sin put him on the cross. I understand that these words are spoken against me. This good news that has plenty of bad news in it. The wages of sin is death. It's against me. And when you find that, and you're brokenhearted, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And as believers, our whole task is to take him at his word and walk before him. Today, if today you're hearing his word, let me just, and I don't think I'm misusing it when I say this. Look at verse 26. Have you heard what I'm saying? Have you heard what Jesus is saying? Become silent. I mean it. Just stop saying, well, what about? Or how come? Or I don't see, modern science has proven. No, 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 that stuff is going to wash away. I guarantee you. And if you bank on man's ideas versus God's word, you will be. Sadly disappointed. No, if you've understood that he's speaking against you, just be silent. And then, speak. Lord, save me. Call out like Peter did. And you know what? He will take hold of you. He will catch you. He will rescue you. This is the good news we proclaim. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And this is the gospel that you and I get to proclaim at the office tomorrow and on our sports teams and in the locker room and in the classroom and over the backyard fence, so to speak. Jesus Christ came to save wretches like us. God laid my sin on him that I might have life. Oh, this is good news. Jesus Christ will take hold of you if you'll quit trying to take hold of his word and let it take hold of you, if you will. Father.